colleagues from the media, thank you very much for participating in today's press briefing from the Palace of the President in Jakarta. Today is the fifth briefing that we had so far, and I have the honor today to be accompanied by my good colleague, my good friend, Minister of Education and Culture, Mas Nadim Makarim, uh, and he will share with you how he managed the education system during the pandemic. And of course, Professor Viku Adisasmida, Sasmira is with us also to share and brief us on the development of issues directly related to COVID-19. Colleagues from the international media, allow me to update or share with you some issues related to my portfolio. First is on Indonesians returning home. In total, as per yesterday, more than 95,000 Indonesian, or to be more exact, 95,102 has returned home. The majority of them are those coming from Malaysia and Indonesian crew working at cruise ships. Between 19 March until 13 of May 2020, 74,817 Indonesian have returned from Malaysia. 21% of them returned via land transportation, 64% via sea transportation, and 15% via air transportation. Meanwhile, 15,820 Indonesian crews have returned so far from 21 countries, arriving in Indonesia through dedicated entry points, namely more than 41% via Murah Rai Airport, about 44% via Soekarno-Hatta Airport, and then around 8% via Tanjung Priok Port, and almost 6% via Benoa port. On top of that, around 4,465 Indonesian have returned home via self-repatriation from 28 countries, which include 15 Indonesian from Singapore that arrived in Surabaya yesterday. One thing that I would like to underline here Mandatory health protocol is applied to all returnees as regulated by the Ministry of Health. And furthermore, the government will also issue or publish a protocol book on self-quarantine for returning Indonesian from abroad. At this very moment, the National uh, Task Force of COVID-19 is working closely with relevant ministries and stakeholders to finalize this uh, book or the uh, guidance of self-repatriation. Colleagues from the international media, my second point is Indonesia continuous engagement in the ministerial coordination group on COVID-19 meeting. I usually call it the International Coordination Group on COVID-19 or ICG. On Tuesday, two days ago, the group met again for the eight times and I was the lead speaker on the role of private sector in the supply chain during COVID-19 pandemics. 11 ministers participated in the meeting. Australia, Canada, Germany, Italy, Morocco, Peru, Singapore, South Africa, Turkey, and the United Kingdom. During the meeting, I underlined the essential role of private sector in addressing the pandemic by being part of the solution. 
In this regard, Indonesia proposed the establishment of a platform that can facilitate greater cooperation and collaboration among private sectors to produce the need for medical supplies and equipment amidst the surge in global demand for the said supplies. So basically, the platform will serve as a catalyst for private sector of different countries to share information on their capacity and resources and what needs they sought from others through cooperation in regard to the production of medical supplies and equipment. All the undertakings of the platform are intended to facilitate business-to-business -business matchmaking and this platform is doable and for sure any future engagement must comply with applicable rules and procedure in respective countries including in relation to product quality standards and competition law moreover this platform should be in line with the fundamental principle of the WTO and after presenting the initiative the platform that I mentioned I received positive supports from the meeting and ministers agreed to follow up the initiative this initiative is one of the Indonesia efforts to promote innovative cooperation amidst the pandemic and my third and last point colleagues is on COVID-19 and peacekeeping operation or PKO as we are all aware COVID-19 has enormous impacts for all countries including countries affected by conflict the situation on the ground which is already fragile due to the ongoing conflict is now worsened by COVID-19 due to the limited health infrastructure, fragile security, challenging economic situation, and dear humanitarian condition. COVID-19 has impacted the implementation of the mandate for PKOs. Among others, difficulties in engaging with conflicting parties to foster peace and mediation effort and the limitation of the movement and activities of peacekeeping personnel and humanitarian access and then logistical and rotation difficulties due to unavailability of transportation and air travel. During the UN Security Council meetings, Indonesia always stressed the importance of safety and security as well as health of the UN peacekeeping personnel. In this regard, Indonesia co-sponsored the UN Security Council Resolution number 2518 on the safety and security of peacekeeping personnel, which is adopted on the 30th of March 2020. Based on the UN Secretariat data, COVID-19 cases have been confirmed in all countries and territories hosting peacekeeping operation. That is in 13 missions, one, three missions. 64 peacekeepers have contracted the virus. Most cases, most cases are in MINUSMA, in Mali. 23 of them have already recovered. To date, there are no Indonesian peacekeepers infected with COVID-19. But we remain alert and continue to closely follow developments on the ground. As the largest troops and police contributing countries, or I call it 
TPCCC in the Security Council or the eighth largest TPCCC in the UN. Indonesia will continue to closely follow the impact of COVID-19 to our peacekeepers. On top of that, colleagues, the UN Secretary General has launched a global ceasefire on 23rd March 2020 to allow the de delivery of humanitarian assistance in various conflicts. And as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council, Indonesia welcomes and supports the call of the UN Security General. Indonesia, together with other members, is also currently active in formulating a draft resolution in the Security Council on measures that need to be taken to address challenges of COVID-19 in the areas of peace and security. Unfortunately, the draft resolution has yet to reach consensus. The longer the UN Security Council cannot agree on the draft resolution on COVID-19, it will give a negative signal on the ground and may even worsen the situation for the population in many conflict areas. UN Security members, UN Security Council members should concentrate on enhancing cooperation for the sake of protecting people in conflict areas. Indonesia stands ready to continue contributing to the negotiation on the draft resolution in the UN Security Council. So colleagues, that is all from me. And now allow me to invite my good colleagues, Minister Nadim Makarim, to convey some updates. Thank you. Pak Nadim, dipersilakan. Thank you so much, uh, Minister, um, for inviting me for this press conference. Um, also, thank you to members of the foreign press for allowing me to speak a few words and updates about the situation, specifically with regard to education uh, in Indonesia during this COVID-19 crisis. So I think the first most important point is that the situation even before the COVID-19 crisis was already a very challenging uh, situation for education in Indonesia. Being the fourth largest educational system in the world, in a developing economy, in the largest archipelago uh, in the world, um, the logistical infrastructure uh, and inequity issues had already been quite acute. So the COVID crisis um, exacerbated a lot of those trends. But the team uh, in the Ministry of Education uh, are doing uh, everything in their power night and day to try to improve the situation and also try to mitigate the biggest risks uh, throughout this crisis. So it's important uh, that from the very beginning when the COVID-19 crisis occurred that the Ministry of Education took a principle-based approach in how to make decisions. And the first principle that we took was health first. And so the Ministry of Education actually took the lead and the initiative in implementing study from home. Uh, we worked together with all the districts in Indonesia to encourage and support them and um, through the transition to studying from home. And for the universities, which are directly under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Education, we implemented uh, study from home immediately. Um, as a nationwide uh, policy. So we provided the regulatory framework even before companies were starting to work from home uh, and the other type of containment measures. So we really uh, took the initiative that health was first and the safety of our teachers, our students, and their parents was the first priority. And so 
uh, schools everywhere in areas that were affected by COVID uh, started studying uh, from home. Uh, the second thing that we did was we also reprioritized the resources of the Ministry of Education, particularly with budget, and thought, asked ourselves the question, how can we help and support the fight, the acute critical fight? And the first thing that we did was we reallocated budget uh, to our medical universities, uh, as well as our educational um, uh, hospitals uh, that train uh, to be doctors and nurses to actually focus uh, them to becoming COVID crisis centers. Um, we also, uh, over uh, 13 uh, hospitals uh, that were for, dedicated for education were open to become COVID testing centers, as well as 13 uh, faculties of health that also became testing centers uh, for COVID. We also reallocated budget to do one of the largest volunteer uh, training sessions together with the WHO to train 15,000 uh, uh, medical students to become volunteers during the COVID crisis for crisis mitigation, tracing, uh, and a variety of uh, testing support and logistics efforts. So we trained over 15,000 of these medical students uh, to be able to become uh, volunteers that are now out uh, in the field. Then we had to tackle uh, the biggest problem of all, which is how do we ensure, um, unfortunately we have to make this uh, uh, decision about how do we ensure that some learning is happening during this crisis instead of no learning at all. And that is where we took a very diverse approach and pragmatic approach about what we can do to ensure that some learning is still happening and that the effects of COVID-19 do not fall disproportionately upon our youth because of the lack of access to schools. Um, so the first thing we did was to actually open uh, and work with a variety of technology platforms and ed tech companies uh, with which to implement affordable online learning. Uh, a lot of it was free um, to as many uh, areas and districts as possible and provide as many options as possible. Uh, the importance of the option is because Indonesia is unprecedented in the diversity uh, and uh, heterogeneity in terms of uh, socioeconomics, um, uh, ethnicity, and geography, that we had to provide multiple solutions to allow every single area, school, uh, and district to do what was best for their own uh, uh, educational system. So one is through online learning. Um, the second uh, is there, we discovered also that even that there were huge um, uh, amounts of challenges also with online learning. So for those that did not have access directly to internet, we also uh, experimented with actually um, taking a very large chunk of one of our TV stations airtime and dedicated to uh, education, dedicated to uh, numeracy, uh, literacy, uh, as well as to a variety of uh, cultural enrichment and uh, also critical thinking, uh, edutainment uh, uh, content. So, um, so we, we launched online learning, we also launched TV-based learning, learning from home, but even that in many, many areas in Indonesia was not sufficient, and so then we had to rely on the feet on the street and uh, the actual teachers that were mobilizing themselves to actually teach door to door. And so we have no one single approach for every single area, but we have a very highly pragmatic and diversified approach to make sure that some learning is happening instead of no learning uh, at all. Having said that, the situation is by no means optimal, and to say that um, educational achievement levels would be able to be the same uh, during this COVID crisis uh, would, would not be true for Indonesia or any other country in the world uh, for that matter. So we have to accept the, that unfortunate reality, but mitigate the risk as much as, much as possible. One of the most important things that we did was to, in order to unleash the ability for each of these schools to conduct these types of learning, we also created a series of regulations that would increase the flexibility of how school budgets can actually be utilized to tackle this crisis. So the first thing we did was to release uh, the budgets that are sent from the central government to the local schools themselves to be used for 
health equipment, uh, sanitizers, maskers, as well as to buy data, mobile data, in order to implement a lot of the uh, online uh, activities, online learning activities and studying from home. So we really freed up the use of the school budgets to be able to be used to buy uh, data um, and internet uh, data in order uh, for both the teachers as well as for uh, the students. We also dedicated a lot of resource to actually launch a public education campaign around COVID um, that was aired in multiple TV stations uh, because it's actually quite important that as the education ministry that we take part in actually helping understand what are the key drivers of getting out of this crisis and how it all comes down to human behavior. And so we participated in, in that. Um, in terms of culture, we also provision um, platforms where artists and, and cultural figures can go and perform and uh, entertain and lift spirits of people sitting at home uh, through a variety of online channels and as well as virtual tours of museums and heritage sites to keep that flavor of our national heritage alive during this crisis. Um, like I said, the, the, uh, it, this definitely affected and the inequities that existed before were exacerbated by this crisis but there are a few positive um, things that we can take away from this crisis. Um, one of the most, uh, I think, pos positive things that we can take away, despite all the unfortunate negative effects, is actually that for the first time, um, parents all across uh, Indonesia are finally uh, realizing how difficult it is uh, to become a teacher and to teach their students. So there's been a huge heightened sense of empathy uh, from parents towards teachers and understanding the challenges that they face teaching. And in a similar way, the parent, the, the teachers are also realizing how important the role of parents are in education and that the parents are a core partner in the educational success of, of the children. Um, and I think also the, the last and final point is that we have never seen before, it's an unprecedented amount of technology adoption in such a short time frame by teachers, by parents, and by students, uh, uh, in, in, I would say in the history of, 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 of Indonesia, uh, because of uh, learning fr uh, from home, studying from home. And so even though huge amounts of parts of Indonesia struggle with adopting to these technologies, a lot of people are being forced to experiment and try and for the first time use these tools which will actually uh, heavily accelerate technology adoption and education in the future and in general. And so I think that is one uh, very, very uh, encouraging trend that once the COVID-19 crisis is done, the adoption to enhanced technologies and education to support teachers and to support parents and students uh, can be accelerated. Um, thank you very much. Thank you again, Minister uh, of Foreign Affairs, for the opportunity, and I'll be answering questions in the next section. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the interne international media colleagues that are joining this occasion. Thank you, Ibu Retno, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, and Pak Nadim, Minister of Education and Culture. I'm Wikwa Disasmito, representing Pak Doni Monardo and the National Task Force for the acceleration of the COVID-19 mitigations. For the umpteenth uh, time, we, the humankind, are forced to face another pandemic. Although it is a recurrent event, we are never prepared for such a catastrophe. None of us do. And compared to 75 years ago, when we started building this great nation, it is an disputed fact that we and the billions of people in the world are in a better health condition and thus should be in a better mental condition and a better mindset including in facing the pandemic. This is the mental situations in the National Task Force COVID-19 response. We believe that panic is not the answer. 
and the misinformation is a disaster. So, this pandemic should be about increasing our public health system and reinforcing that need to have a healthy body and healthy mind. This pandemic should not be about addressing the state of excessive information about a problem, which make it difficult to identify a solution. The state that misinformation, disinformation, and rumors cloud our health emergency responses. Infodemics can hamper an effective public health response and create confusion and distrust among people. There is no vaccine against this plague. The only way to get out of it to build common trust. The government, ours, and the government across the world will do their best to protect their people. And in return, the people should protect each other. Protect yourself, protect others. As WHO Director General said, the cure to the situation, first and foremost, is national unity and global solidarity. We call up on you, our esteemed media colleagues, work with us and world government to focus on addressing COVID-19 pandemic, to laser focus on crippling the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and nothing else. Now, I would like to return this to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Minister Makarem, and thank you very much, Professor Riku. Uh, colleagues, uh, now we move on the uh, Q&A session as usual and so far we have received questions from nine medias, Morocco Press Agency, ABC, Voice of America, Anadolu, China Central TV, Channel News Asia, Sky News, Dutch Welle, and AFP. And of course, Minister Makarim will answer questions related to the education sector, while Paviku will provide some technical uh, updates and data as well as all the technical details. And on my part, I will address questions related to my portfolio. So my first response is four questions from Morocco Press Agency in regard to the latest development of international cooperation for COVID-19 mitigation. To date, Indonesia has collaborated with 104 international partners, comprising of 10 countries, 10 international organizations, and 84 NGOs. And then to answer question from Deutsche Welle in regard to further investigation on human rights violation against Indonesian crews on Chinese vessel, I would like to convey some updates. I met with 14 Indonesian crews on Sunday, the 10th of May and gather further information on what they had encountered during working on the fish vessels. Before the meeting with the crews, I also met the investigation team from the police. And then on the 13th of May, I had another meeting with the investigation team and directly led by the chief of Criminal Investigation Agency, and I'm so glad to hear the strong commitment of the police to follow up the cases. And then on May 11, my ambassador in Beijing also met again with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of China to follow up previous discussion, and I do hope that the Chinese government will fulfill their promise to thoroughly investigate 
the cases. Going forward, our efforts are aimed to ensuring right of the crews are fulfilled and then follow up of this matter through legal process both by the authorities in Indonesia as well as by Chinese authorities. And then on top of the legal uh, process, the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, just yesterday facilitated the meeting between the companies and the families of two deceased crews, among others, to ensure shift settlement of the crew's financial right, as well as to provide further clarification on the sea burial of the deceased crews. In regard to question by Voice of America on further development regarding the Ministerial Coordination Group of COVID-19, or I usually uh, say it ICJ, especially on the access to vaccine for all countries and the response by member countries such as the UK, Germany, France, and Canada. I think I had explained this in my previous uh, meeting, and I don't want to repeat it again. And the last meeting, that is the eighth meeting that I mentioned during uh, the briefing, uh, I had also uh, mentioned about the result of the ICJ meeting that was held two days ago. And then on the vaccine, yesterday I had a phone conversation with the Foreign Minister of Costa Rica and discuss again about access to vaccine and medicine for all countries. Costa Rica invited Indonesia to join call to action to create a global pool of health technology for detection, prevention, control and treatment of COVID-19, which will, that which will be launched on the 15th May 2020, which is tomorrow. In principle, Costa Rica call for action is in line with the Indonesian position on equitable access to vaccine and medicine, which is needed to tackle the pandemic. Further collaboration with various countries are needed, of course, to ensure the initiative works well. Furthermore, Indonesia is also a co-sponsor of the draft resolution of WHA 73, that is on COVID-19 response at the World Health Assembly. The negotiation was concluded just yesterday, last night. I talked with my team uh, in Geneva and in Jakarta, and the adoption will be held next Monday. So Indonesian inputs on accessible and affordable vaccine, as well as equal distribution and flexibility of trips were taken on board. And then responding to the ABC question on the number of Indonesian crew death due to COVID-19 on board cruise ships, I would like to convey that as of yesterday, four crews have passed away in four cruise ships, namely MS Zandam, Oasis of the Sea, MV Viking Star, and Costa Fascinosa. And then answering the Dutch Railway question on the surveillance control of 30,000 returning Indonesian migrant workers, I believe that I have mentioned this earlier during my presentation that mandatory health protocol is applied to all returnees. And then it brings me to the question from China Central TV on China orderly resumption of production, its economic development status, 
development potential and development prospect. What I would like to say is that China is one of the Indonesia important partner for trade and investment. On top of China, ASEAN, ROK, Japan, India, US are among our key partners as well. And Indonesia always stands ready to continue building strong relations with all partners based on mutual benefit, mutual interest, and mutual respect. Now that I have answered the question directed to me, and now I give the floor back to Minister Makarin to answer the question directed to him, and then after that, of course, to Professor Wiku. Thank you very much, colleague, for giving me some question. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the first question I'll be answering is from Channel News Asia. And the question is, what is the effectiveness of home-based learning so far? Uh, an entire cohort will potentially end up being behind their studies. Uh, what will you do about this? Uh, it's a great question. Um, first of all, just to be scientifically sound, um, the ability for us to determine the effectiveness of home-based learning will definitely take much more time than the immediate two months. Um, these kind of analyses need to be seen over a period, much longer period of time, unfortunately. But what we do know now is we have a lot of anecdotal evidence about some of the challenges of online learning. And a lot of it is what you would expect. Um, the, there are some groups or some areas or some schools that have really uh, shown incredible innovation uh, in the ability to use a variety of technological tools and low-tech solutions as well, like one-to-one uh, -one teaching at home, et cetera, that, that a lot of uh, teachers have innovated. But there are also uh, some areas and some schools that are a little bit slow, uh, behind in the curve, uh, and therefore are at uh, bigger risk. So there's a very, very wide discrepancy of the effectiveness of, of home-based learning. Uh, I would say that the, the, the most uh, encouraging thing that we see is not actually the effects today and whether or not it will actually be able to compensate for uh, children not being in school. I think uh, the effectiveness is much more felt in the future effectiveness of comfort and uh, adoption of technology in the future because technology is a core part of our plan in the Ministry of Education to support teachers and parents in improving their ability to uh, uh, personalize learning, teaching at the right level, and really focusing on competency instead of content. And technology plays a pivotal role uh, at an educational system of this size. So I think some of those positive effects of home learning will be felt after the COVID-19 crisis and not so much uh, in during the crisis itself. Um, some of the things that we did from a regulatory perspective to mitigate uh, uh, the, the kind of the risks of home learning is we actually created a regulatory framework that did not force um, teachers to actually complete comprehensively the curriculum towards this final semester. Um, we did something uh, quite dramatic too, is that we were going to change the national exam anyway next year to be more like PISA, to be more analytical based, but we decided to accelerate that and cancel the national examinations this year that would be happening right now, primarily for health issues. But these two things that we did, both uh, relaxing the requirements on completing the syllabus, as well as lifting the uh, national exam for this year or uh, canceling it for this year, actually enabled more flexibility in teachers to focus on foundational numeracy and literacy subjects instead of trying to cover the entire gamut of the curriculum. Um, and we thought that was very important to give that time and flexibility for teachers to adapt to this new situation during the crisis. Um, next question is 
from uh, uh, also from Channel News Asia, and it's a quite a similar question to the uh, question from Voice of America, so I'll answer it at the same time. The first question is, a lot of children in Indonesia do not have internet access and also even TV to watch TVRI and its educational programs. Uh, what will you do about this? And the Voice of America question is, how do you overcome the gap between families who have internet uh, and not in online learning during a pandemic? So I'll try to tackle this question from, from a few uh, angles. So the, the yes, there are a lot of children and families that do not have access to internet and TV. Uh, many more of those uh, students that have, don't have access to internet rather than don't have access to both internet and TV. Generally speaking, within each neighborhood, uh, because of the penetration of, of uh, 3G uh, everywhere, uh, most children in Indonesia will have access to an Android handset, even if it's not within their immediate nuclear family. Um, and they will have access to, to uh, a phone connection. Um, TV is also very widely penetrated in Indonesia, even though some areas, especially in the remote areas, still don't have access. They even have issues with uh, uh, electricity and stable electricity connection. So the solutions of how to tackle this cannot be sorted within a two-month crisis management period. All of the solutions are uh, to tackle this are future-oriented and have to deal with actually solving the root cause inequity issues in infrastructure themselves. So the COVID-19 crisis has actually accelerated and catapulted all of the government initiatives to actually close the gap. Uh, close the gap in what way? Close the gap in infrastructure development, particularly for the educational system. Close the gap in internet connectivity, uh, which means you have to inevitably solve the gap for uh, electricity stability as well in order for internet uh, stability to be achieved. So these are activities that are cross-functional uh, um, uh, between ministries and not just the Ministry of Education. So we'll be working with a, an array of other ministries to actually really focus on these areas that are still disconnected from the rest of Indonesia. Now, those in inequities cannot only be solved by infrastructure developments. The most important inequity in the educational system come from the quality of teachers themselves. So the primary focus, even though we use a lot of technology as tools in the plan of the Ministry of Education moving forward, the primary focus is really enhancing the human capabilities in teaching and redistributing quality teachers and having the best of our teachers actually lead schools to become principals is the core focus of our educational drive, with or without the COVID-19 crisis. But the COVID-19 crisis accelerated this initiative uh, in a very cat uh, catalytic way. Um, having said that, the TV, we were extremely surprised. I mean, we, we rushed to, to create the, the educational TV content initiative in order to, to make sure that as many uh, children had the opportunity to learn from TV that didn't have access to online, but we were extremely shocked to see the, the reception. Um, the, the ratings that we received from TVRI were among the highest we've seen uh, uh, in a while uh, when we launched the program. So the appetite to learn by, by both parents and, and students is was something that was um, a very pleasant surprise for us. and provided a lot of motivation for the Ministry of Education to continue with these kind of um, alternative programs of learning. Um, we've also been extremely inspired by seeing the grassroots movement of teachers in remote areas that have actually implemented door-to-door -door teaching policies. And this was extremely moving as well as inspiring for other teachers in regions to kind of take the initiative and, and not leave any child left be uh, behind. Um, I'm going to answer the next question from Voice of America. Uh, in the past two months, there has been a trend of increasing numbers of underage married girls in Solo and several other cities due to increased economic inequality and poverty as a result of COVID-19. What can be done by the education uh, ministry to underline uh, the importance of education for girls and how to create an education direction that is gender-oriented? Um, this is a... a, a fantastic uh, question. Um, I think the first thing that every type of organizational system needs to do to improve something is to measure it correctly. 
and that is why we have we are transforming our national exam system to achieve a global standard, which is like the PISA and OECD standard, uh, but also have survey questions that are actually assessing the value systems. Um, at the same time. So we will be assessing the cognitive analytical capabilities, but also the value systems that are in place in our educational systems. And gender equality and gender empowerment will be a critical pillar in that assessment metric. We will be surveying schools and how they view gender equality, how they view gender dynamics. We will be assessing um, uh, schools and systems, both teachers and students, on what are their perceptions around um, uh, sexual uh, uh, harassment and uh, uh, violence or views surrounding those topics. Um, in the university uh, sector, uh, what we plan to do is, is actually, we plan to go, which universities in Indonesia are under the direct jurisdiction of the Ministry of Education, so it's nationally run. Um, and regulated instead of schools which are district uh, uh, run. Um, in the university sections, we're gonna take this one step further and actually create organizational systems and reporting mechanisms for uh, sexual violence, which is a critical uh, component of gender equality. It's a critical, actually, negative externality of gender inequity, uh, of why uh, sexual violence and sexual harassment exists. And so we are going head on and tackling that along with radicalization and also bullying as another two factors. But this will be a pivotal uh, push to eradicate these, um, uh, these um, kind of moral issues that we see in our educational system. So the ministry is taking a very proactive approach in, in tackling these issues. Having said that, in the previous administrations and the previous uh, ministries before my time here, uh, Indonesia has achieved a fair amount in actually setting equity and participation of male and female in both higher education and lower education. So it cannot be gone without being said that that's uh, already an impressive achievement, at least from the statistics. But now the challenge is how to create the mindsets for gender uh, uh, equality uh, at starting from a very, very young age and to mitigate the, the more darker consequences of that uh, as, as the kids grow up. So, so that's kind of our overall strategy in, in introducing uh, gender equality. So two student profiles that we're focusing on and we're assessing, uh, one is actually morality and ethics, and the second is uh, universal um, uh, citizenship. Um, these two aspects of our six student profiles, these are two out of student profiles, gender equality uh, and, and, and ethics are going to be critical components within these two uh, student profile achievements that we're trying to focus on. Um, a lot of teachers, uh, the next question is by AFP. Uh, a lot of teachers are struggling with online learning uh, suggested by the Ministry of Education and Cultures. What is the solution for that? This is a very difficult question to answer. Um, there, are, there are many, many solutions, but the solutions differ depending on which school, which area, and which level of technology adoption that they're accustomed to. There are schools that are utilizing chat platforms uh, to facilitate uh, learning between students and teachers. Uh, there are schools that are using learning management systems or more advanced platforms that are dedicated for education to actually uh, implement learning from home. There are schools that are strictly using video conferencing tools and doing a lot of asynchronous live school sessions uh, doing this. And then there are schools that simply because of infrastructural issues are doing door-to-door, -door, um, still manual, but door-to-door -door training or tutoring of their students, uh, which are quite admirable. Uh, this, everyone is learning at the same time. Um, including the Ministry of Education. So a, a, very, um, uh, uh, a very diversified and very scientific, we're taking a very scientific approach by seeing, taking this time to observe and getting anecdotal evidence and seeing what actually works in these technology platforms and what don't. So that when we return back to school after this crisis, we are able to scale up the solutions that we know work for which segments of our educational system the best. Uh, as we would have expected, the ability for uh, university students to adapt to learning from home, even though it, uh, it, they have their own challenges uh, from a budgetary or uting, utilizing data and quota costs that have increased high, they are much more um, uh, quick to adopt 
uh, as university students to the online learning part, um, especially the students, even more so than the professors themselves. So we've seen that as a very, uh, we expected that, but I think the, the, the struggle to adopt really uh, is happening in our lower educational system, and that's where uh, the challenges will go. But we'll take the best of what works, and we'll eliminate uh, the things that didn't work, and we'll apply that in moving forward of how we're going to use technology in a non-COVID crisis situation, uh, whether we want to employ hybrid learning, whether we want to use technology for personalized or segmented groups or cohorts and classes, how we're going to use assessments to break up classes into smaller chunks based on their competency level. These are all the um, kind of the next generation tools that are now being stress tested in the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, the final question I will answer is from AFP as well is, what has changed in the Indonesia education system amid current COVID-19 pandemic, e.g. learning materials, syllabus, or assessment? So what hasn't changed? Uh, that, I think that's the better question. I think everything has changed um, uh, uh, pretty dramatically, not just in Indonesia, but around the world. I think the first thing that, that, that will be a new normal is the, the, the use and adoption of technology tools uh, for teachers, students, I think that will fundamentally change how uh, students and teachers interact. The ability for teachers to actually break up their class into more effective learning groups and do that, you can only do that with technology. Um, the ability for teachers to implement project-based learning and have kids independently do activities uh, project-based and being mentored remotely so they don't have to do it within a synchronous class environment in class. I think those are all big opportunities that will permanently be changed by the COVID-19 crisis. The second is the role of parents. I think this will permanently change uh, in the educational system. The, the, the interest of parents and the ability of parents to participate in the educational learning of their, of their children uh, will be a, 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 a wave that is accelerated. And this is a very positive wave. Uh, that will be accelerated. Instead of simply outsourcing education to, to schools and to teachers, parents now feel a renewed interest to be engaged and participate in the education of their kids. The exam, um, this was going to happen even before COVID-19, but it just got accelerated. We changed our national standard exam to move from content, rote-based uh, memorization to uh, critical and analytical thinking, more akin to the PISA. Uh, we will do this as a way of measuring not individual student performance, but of overall school performance. Those are fundamental changes in how we're assessing. They are no longer punitive assessments, but they are uh, accountable to the principal and to the district educational systems, not to the individual students who should not be punished for their test results. I think that's going to be a fundamental transformation. Using technology to deliver those systems, those assessments, and to create assessments that will not be done only at a national scale, but to uh, decentralize those assessments that can be used day to day by students, that will require technology. Uh, in order to do that. Um, so I think the, the, uh, the other thing that will change is the level of volunteerism that we've seen, which has been unprecedented in the COVID-19 crisis. Indonesia is a country that has gone through a series of, of da disasters, uh, natural or otherwise, and uh, because of that, it has trained its volunteering muscle to the extent that we're seeing incredible levels of civic society stepping up in both the education space and other spaces to really uh, uh, pick up the torch and support each other during this time of crisis. Um, I think those are the questions that I can answer today. So yes, we're seeing a, a lot of suboptimal uh, learning happening uh, in Indonesia and in the rest of the world as a result of this, but um, the amount of learnings that we can take from this crisis and the mental resilience and new normals that can come after this crisis can become uh, big opportunities for us to accelerate changes that we wanted to do before, but now are given the opportunity and momentum to do it faster and, and, and in a more innovative way. Thank you very much, really appreciate it. Okay, I'd like to answer questions from the media. I have uh, nine questions. The first one is the most difficult one. So the first question is from the ABC and the Morocco Press Agency. The Indonesian president expressed disappointment on Monday because of the screening rates remains below 10,000 tests. 
per day. Why has Indonesia failed to exceed this threshold? How could Indonesia cope with the shortage of laboratory technicians? What new measures are being taken to reach 10,000 tests per day? So uh, I would like to respond uh, to these questions. First is that since the arrival of the pandemic, we understand that Indonesia has limited capacity when it comes to testing. And questions have been raised does the number of cases today reflect our testing capacity? One cannot simply follow the rule book of other countries. Therefore, the task force alongside the Ministry of Health and other ministries has mapped out the strategy to get through these uh, hurdles. Compared to the earlier days of the outbreak, we have achieved a lot of progress and improvements in terms of the lab capacities. The number of the labs capable of performing the test have been ramped up. Indonesia has also embarked producing its own test kits by March, and we keep exerting to escalate the number. Steadily increasing numbers of referral laboratories and providing testing equipments to priority laboratories. Local governments have also stepped up in finding alternatives to conventional laboratory testing. One of the prime examples is from the West Sumatra province. The region has been able to develop a method of pooling tests for COVID-19. It has been held in five districts or cities and is awaiting evaluations. Although the pooling test is commonly used in laboratories, it can be valid enough to be represented in the populations if combined with the epidemiological methods. So this is one of the innovations that has been uh, developed by the local governments. With the current data integration, we are able to map out the burden of the disease so that we know how to treat them. Hopefully in the days ahead, Indonesia could suffice the need of COVID-19 testing. We are aware that this is a tough uh, task, but we are trying our best. The second question is from the NHK, Morocco Press Agency, and also ABC. When will the epidemic peak to be reached in Indonesia? Any chance of a second wave? Our response to this question, first as the national second wave should not happen, but we need to be prepared for it at all times. There will be a chance of the second wave if our citizens do not follow the government advice. The discipline is carrying out healthy behaviors as recommended is the essence of evading the second wave. Perhaps it is also imperative to observe now things are running in each of the regions, not only on the national scope. For wherever the arises in the local scope, will impact the nation. The second wave may only occur in regions in which the people do not comply with the health recommendations. At the national level, we, the National Task Force for COVID-19, always keep in track in strengthening the national, uh, our public health systems on the national scope. We have been trying to do our best However, we couldn't do this alone. We need all Indonesian citizens to hand in hand tackle this pandemic. Thus, our local task force are the backbone of the success in making sure that things are running well in the local scope. The third question is raised by the NHK. The question is, the estimated peak number of people infected was 95,000. But at this moment, the number is far below than prediction. Does it mean the government is succeeding to contain the virus of Indonesia, doesn't have enough facilities to contain it? Our response to this uh, questions, we have heard some speculations arise regarding the estimated number for the coronavirus peak in Indonesia. We understand that many models have been created in predicting the curve However, we need to bear in mind 
that models do not count changes and do not represent the reality on the ground. For instance, today, we have seen there is a decline in bed occupancy rate for the COVID-19. Though we are aware that not all of the COVID-19 positive cases are hospitalized, and we must still be cautious of the second wave threat, this represents a good sign. The last thing we want it is our health facility being overwhelmed by the surge of the COVID-19 cases. The fourth question raised by the Morocco Press Agency. The question is, Indonesia plans to produce its own test kits and ventilators, so what are the latest developments? We have seek the information that we believe that the health industry in Indonesia will never be the same after COVID-19. The government, through the Ministry of Research and Technology, alongside other ministries, universities, experts, and private sectors are joining forces in strengthening our health industry capacity. Medical devices for test kits, namely non-PCR, PCR-based rapid tests are in the stage validation test and registrations at the Ministry of Health later this month is expected to be produced. For ventilators, it has been reported that there have been four prototypes ventilators that have been tested by the device. One of the ventilators from the Institute Technology Bandung, ITB, has passed clinical trials and obtained permission to use emergency condition. Three other ventilators from the University of Indonesia and the Ministry of Research and Technology are in the process of clinical trials. The fifth question is from the Morocco Press Agency. If the viral epidemic persists in Indonesia, does the country not envisage a scenario of cohabitation with COVID-19? Indonesia government actions to mitigate the biological disaster of COVID-19 pandemic is also to facilitate Indonesian citizens to change their behavior toward a healthy lifestyle and a good personal hygiene. Parallelly, we do preconditional approaches, measurement of the timing, coordination between the central and local authorities, sorting down the priorities and monitoring and evaluations as a huge strategic plan in accelerating COVID-19 handling in Indonesia. Virus is also a God creation of what we are. It is created by nature as the natural imbalance happens globally and so do other diseases which exist to date. All in all, this is all up to nature. If we protect the nature, nature will protect us. And if we bring imbalance to nature, nature will bring imbalance to us, as what happens today by the presence of COVID-19. But Doni Monardo, the head of the National Task Force, always remind us with Al-Quran 41st verse of Surah Ar-Rum. I just read this. Corruption has appeared throughout the land and sea by the reasons of what the hands of people have earned so he may let them taste part of the consequence of what they have done that perhaps they will return to righteousness. People nowadays should remember Hablu Minallah, Hablu Minanas, which encourages relationship not only with humans but also with the God. We emphasize that the new approaches, behaviors can enable us as human beings that have high adaptation skill to adapt once more to this global chance in order to regain balance between human and nature. The six questions from Channel News Asia. Bapak Doni Monardo said that those under 45 years can be allowed to go out and work. When is this going to be implemented? What are the conditions for this to happen? What will this be for all industries and occupations? Our response is 
even during the PSBB, there are 11 types of occupations that are allowed to go resume activities. This can be done with the record of applying PSBB with the discipline, wearing a mask, keeping a distance, washing hands frequently when they get home, and taking a shower and changing clothes. And this is applied to all ages. From the COVID-19 data we have recently, people from the age 45 years and below have a smaller risk of death, around 15%, and above 46 years have a risk of death reaching 85%. If anyone has a comorbid disease, it will have a higher risk. This data has provided navigation for us to protect our most vulnerable groups of people, but we cannot only depend on the mortality data only. Health comes first, well-being too. There is no trade-off between public health and the economy. They are intertwined, entangled. There is an urgent need of the people to shift ways of living and working. The composition of our economic growth is mainly supported by the household consumption. Productive labor force in Indonesia, according to 2019 BPJS data, nearly 130 million can still contribute to the economy. The workforce that is expected to be productive, of course, must be healthy, does not have any accompanying diseases that are at risk of becoming fatal if exposed to COVID-19, and they have to travel only those who work according to the COVID-19 to the field allowed by the PSBB regulations. Health essential daily needs, energy, communication, and information technology, finance, logistics, hospitality, construction, basic service industries, public utilities that are designated as national vital objects and or certain vital. For other sectors, an analysis will be carried out to determine risk and benefit if allowed to walk by looking at the readiness indicators. The seven questions from the Morocco Press Agency again. When will the restrictions on the entry of foreigners into Indonesia be revised? When will airport activity return to normal? These regulations will be updated in stages with regard to Indonesia's preconditions and readiness. There are protocols that must be followed. At the present, certain domestic flights have been opened conditionally. Recovery of activities at the airport will be carried out in stages taking into account multi-sectoral readiness, health, economy, and social. If an area is considered to have met the readiness indicators of the sector, it is not impossible that the airport there will be opened. The eighth question the gov from the Anadolu and CNA, the government has mentioned several times about plans to ease the large-scale social restrictions. What are the concrete plans for this, and is there a clear timeline? Our response to this that the task force never ease the PSBB. We are observing the situation closely at all times. We are aware of any change and fluctuations that may happen ahead. Currently, there are 34 provinces and 415 districts that have established a local task force working together combating this pandemic. Up to 11 May, there are three provinces and 108 districts that have set the COVID-19 emergency status. Amongst those, four provinces and 14 districts are heavily applying the PSBB. There is a detailed evaluation in the provinces, districts, and cities regarding data on the trend of adding or decreasing new positive cases in each region, both those who are implementing the PSBB or not. There are also evaluation of provinces, districts, cities that do not implement the PSBB 
but also carry out physical distancing policies. The ease of the large-scale social restriction utterly depends on the situations on the field. How ready are we in terms of the populist behavior? Do our people comply with PSBB obediently? How about the readiness of our healthcare facilities, healthcare officers, number of patients being hospitalized? These indicators are closely being analyzed by the National Task Force. The last questions from the uh, Sky News. Experts have said conditions are Tomohon and Langowan are prime for the spread of another disease. What is your reaction? How worried are you that another pandemic could break out from the animal trade and market in Indonesia? What are you doing to stop this? We always need to be cautious of the possibilities of other disease of, diseases of tomorrow. In order to be ready for another threat of emerging diseases, we should prepare all of our capacity, capability, and even policy. Detect, prevent, and respond. These three are the essence of strategy in tackling the outbreak. In order to have healthy world, the health of three aspects, human, animal, and environment, is essential. This is what we call the One Health approach. Just to remind you that some of us have been trained and have constantly learned the evolving risk of viral infections and pandemic potentials. 15 years ago, Indonesian got together and addressed the, the bird flu threat and managed to cut the human fatalities from hundreds to close to none. Eight years ago, we made sure that our Hajj pilgrims came back healthy to their villages in the midst of the MERS-CoV pandemic that started in Saudi Arabia. In closing, I would like to say that yesterday marks the two months of the task force. The baseline is none. No task force, no coordinated massive scale response before the task force. But beyond these numbers lies a far bigger strength, solidarity, and humanity. In facing those global crises, we have strengthened our public health system by focusing on promoting a healthier lifestyle for all Indonesians. Healthier behavior will contribute to an increase of our stamina and most importantly, of our mental well-being. Indonesians have been learning this saying, mensana in corpore sano, since basic school. There is a healthy mind in a healthy body. Allow me to relay a message from Pak Doni Monardo. We have to protect our approach in mitigating COVID-19 through a special empat sehat lima sempurna. First, keep a physical distance. Second, wash your hands. Third, use mask. Fourth, consume nutritious meals, and lastly, maintain your health with regular exercise and adequate rest. I cannot foresee when this pandemic will be fully under control, but I do have a great faith that focusing more on our strength, our collective efforts will help us through tough times. Together, based on national unity and global solidarity. Thank you. I would like to return this to Ibu Mendu. Well, colleagues, this is the end of our press briefing for today. And of course, once again, thank you very much for Mas Menteri, Minister Nadim Makarim, and thank you very much for Professor Wiku Adisa Smita, and for sure, thank you very much for all of you who participated in this press briefing. So. Inshallah, we will see you again, uh, meet you again uh, next week. And to conclude, as usual, stay strong, stay healthy, stay united. Thank you very much.